fish is good. It's good for your body and good for your brain, you know. I've been dropping weight because it's like my main diet now, seafood. I eat, I eat any kind of fish that's good. Fish is good for you. I love the takaki. Yeah, the ahi. I just always like sashimi if I'm gonna get seafood, so I mean that's usually my first pick. I like the garlic ahi. I do love fish. Uh, I'd rather have fish than I eat steak. I'm gonna say the whole island because we love fish. Everybody loves fish. I like uh, pakta. I like native fish. I like a kumu, of course. Kumu, la, la crème de la crème. Because of the Madison Stevens Act, the fishermen can actually give their input into the process. So the fish that the general public gets to eat is a result of the fishermen being conscious of this. The availability of this poke bowl wasn't always a reality for Hawaii. In fact, uh, years ago, foreign fishing vessels would compete with our Hawaii fishermen. They, in fact, would be fishing as close as 12 miles out. And after the passage of the Magnuson-Stevens Act in 1976, we've had a 200-mile exclusive economic zone. Being an island state, Hawaii has always relied heavily on fish to feed its people. Not only do local fisheries feed our residents, but our multi-billion dollar tourism industry as well. Fishing is important and necessary, and ensuring thriving and well-managed fisheries is critical to the well-being of Hawaii and the future of its people. Fishing is really the last harvested product that's coming into Hawaii. I know pineapple fields are shutting down, sugarcane shut down. You know, it's basically the last uh, wild food supply that's come, that uh, Hawaii supplies for itself. You know, a majority of the long line caught fish in Hawaii stays in Hawaii. It's, uh, you know, it's something that everyone appreciates, but not something that everyone really knows where it's coming from or how it's, uh, how it's managed. Tuna is one of the most important species for food security. And it just blows my mind that when we talk about food security in the islands, and fish is one of the most important foods for Hawaiian Islanders, that somehow seafood is left out of the, the planning and the goals of understanding what's out there. A typical day, our workers start unloading the vessels at uh, 12 o'clock at night. Huh? We unload the fish into a cart. It comes out to our weighing station and we weigh it all up, we tag it, we wash it, we ice it, and we put it in storage, or we display it on the auction floor. And at uh, 5.30, the, the bell rings. We count on the auction for a lion's share of our fish. The auction is a key strength for this whole state as far as fish. There's nothing like it anywhere else. Primarily, you know, the auction is the lion's share of the fish because we can get all the pelagics. The big eye tuna drives the whole market, but you get beautiful opa, manchong, ono, mahi, marlin, and then the bottom fish comes in. It's still, I think, awesome to have truly fresh fish without freezing it. And that's where the United Fishing Agency and Westpac uh, comes in to keep us supplied with what people really want. I don't think there's anything, any better seafood in the world than what we got here in Hawaii. This is the best. We cannot have that away from us, you know, we have to keep it. Yeah. Everybody's talking the farm to the table concept, where for me it's a boat to the table and fish is right there. Yeah, exactly. I, buy, I order my fish uh, from Winsing every single night. So I have uh, one main broker is buying for me every day because I buy the fish every day. Every morning, every morning, every morning. You know, when you ask any chef and any buyer anywhere in the mainland, would you prefer wild or farm? Well, the whole world wants wild now, so that's a check for Hawaii. You know, the fish are there, you catch them and then you eat them. Got to be a little bigger. As we always say in Hawaii, we don't play with our food. You know, we, I mean, it's fun to catch, but we're going to eat it. We're not going to throw it back. Well, we actually do throw back some fish. We do have throw back hoggies. <laughs> you know, every single fish, when it's fresh, is delicious. There was a time when 
you know, the boats would catch the opa and nobody knew what to do with it. They didn't know what to do with it, nobody wanted it. So the catch opa, back in the ocean. We couldn't give it away, just like, you know. It was like just a few dollars for the whole fish. You know, no matter how big the fish was, you know, 70, 80 pounds. Once the chefs started to experiment with it, and they found out what it was worth, it's, it's not, it can now be sold and, you know, there's a demand for it. We found a way to appreciate the opa, but also to use everything from the opa. About six months ago, Jonathan Mizukami, who was a sous chef at the French Landry for 10 years, and he told me, uh, I would like uh, to cook the opa belly. I say, number one, Opa, I'm not crazy about it, but the belly, give me a break, get out of here. And uh, he came back uh, maybe a few days after with a dish. He sa I said, what is that? He said, Opa belly. I said, oh, well, I try. I said, okay, we put tonight on the menu. <laughs> that is life, huh? A lot of people are cutting back on meat lately. So then they've been checking out the fish more. So it's very important. Everybody enjoys. As most people come here for the tataki sashimi. There's different grades of the ahi. We try to order the best we can, two plus. I don't want to order something less than that because people, our, our customers know right away if I'm trying to use something cheap. Seal the ahi and then I make the uh, garlic show you. And then now it's number one favorite fish. I always eat my sashimi plate here. That's my special. I don't have to want to channel what I want. I like the bumper sticker that says, like fish, thank a fisherman. Um, I'm really tired of a fisherman getting the rap for raping and plundering. Fishermen are extremely professional people that have helped us do our science and help many people enjoy their food. I started fishing with my dad, six years old. You like being in the ocean so much that it came to be that uh, you end up making a living in the ocean. Our coolie fishing is our, um, is our mainstay. Yes, yeah, so in 1982, El Nino hit us and the uh, fish just all disappeared. And it was a mess because that's, that's all we knew. Yeah, the boat was built for that. We couldn't do anything else for about eight, nine years, we struggled, and our coolie came back in 92. Uh, we, we get in the water about 7.30, 8 o'clock, and then uh, the pilot tells us where to go. And, uh, you know, we try to surround the fish. And if we're successful, uh, it's an early day. If, if the schools aren't that big, then we might have to go again, you know, make another throw to make, make weight. Keep, we try to keep our fish, um, you know, nice for them and nice for the customers. And come in about 11, 11.30, 12 o'clock, and then be cleaning nets like this till maybe 4, four 5 o'clock, and then uh, we'll go deliver the fish. And the end's about 8, 9 o'clock. You know, not too many people want to do this. It's, ri it's ridiculous, the hours and then the pay, and, my mom's generation and the generation after my mom, they, they knew that fishing was hard work. Nobody wanted to do it. Today, nobody wants to do it. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of getting rougher because it's got a lot of um, imported fish now. It's coming to Hawaii. Everybody fighting for a local dollar. Everybody says eat local, but I, I hope they do. <laughs> we like to carry seafood from, well, all over the world, hopefully and a lot of local reef fish, open ocean pelagic fish, and we try to have something for everybody. For our seafood, definitely uh, tamashiros because it's always fresh, it's not um, frozen, there's no uh, carbon monoxide added to the fish. Over here, get always fresh fish. I love fish. Fish is more healthy than a pork, eh? And they live long time. I hope I live till. <laughs> I think it's very important that they fish in a very responsible way so that it's sustainable. And you know, like even my reef fish guys, you know, we just tell them, you know, stay away from these, these items. You know, the price is not there, you're not going to get so, you know, a lot of it's economics too. I mean, if they, if they know they're not going to make money, then they're going to lay off of that particular item. 
or like even in the Opihi, they, they kind of rotate, you know, where they're going to harvest from. The better managed it is, the more assured that we are going to have it forever, which, which is the whole goal, is to have it forever. Uh, Well-managed fishery is, is critically important. Um, let's not forget that we're talking about food production. The ocean is my bank account, and it behooves me to protect my bank account to ensure that I have a resource to draw from tomorrow. So if, if I overexploit, I don't have a bank account. And that's what fishery managers need to understand. I have a vested interest in the fishery. And, and for me to sus be sustainable, the fishery has to be sustainable. No fish, no income, no eat. Uh, we need the food. I think it's really important that the consumer know that these fish are caught under very stringent rules and regulations. It's a healthy, wholesome food and uh, it impacts a wide range of businesses and, and people in the economy. You know, you look at all the people that come here, all the jobs that radiate out from here. You know, have the boats, but you have each of the individual companies, whether they employ people to service the local consumer or restaurant or whether they export fish out. There's, there's so many contact points that originate from here. And you have the retail levels, you have the outlet levels like the hotels, restaurants, all the people that they employ, you know, all the, the, the realtors, accountants, uh, everybody else that's involved in the process. So it's big. Every time the council meets, so that they... This year is the 40th year, um, and it's been very successful. It has accomplished what it set out to do, which is to rein in overfishing. It's done that. One of the original intents of the act was to promote domestic fishing in the EEZ and to exclude foreign fishing. It's accomplished that. You know, I hope that, uh, that the act, that the Magnuson-Stevens Act continues to evolve, continues to fine tune things and, and move the U.S. domestic fishery forward. Congratulations, Westpac, on 40 years. Best wishes to another 40 years of supporting fisheries and fisheries management. Let's support our fishermen so that we can have an abundance of fish for many years to come. Hawaii not having fish both would be a cultural and a economical burden. Yeah, I, I could not understand or survive a world without fish. No, it wouldn't be Hawaii. It would be a sad place without fish. <laughs> a real sad place without fish, yeah. Definitely wouldn't be the same without poke at the beach. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> if without fish. Uh... Oh, no fish. Sorry. That's it. We have to have ahi, no matter what. Without the fishing in yeah, the industry, then we'd be like just eating pork and beef, right? And chicken, so that wouldn't be fun. If we didn't have it on the menu, there'd be rioting. Well, it's everything. <laughs> I mean, that's... Uh... I would say about 75% of our business. So if you take away 75%, we have nothing. <laughs> we close the doors. <laughs> Don't worry, nothing like that's gonna happen. There's always gonna be fish around.